Welcome to the Wilburn Auditorium on the campus of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. I'm Pete Peterson, the Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, and it's a delight to have you for our first of a four-part short course series on the roots of capitalism versus socialism. Over the course of these next four seminars, we are going to be looking at the foundational thinkers, their arguments and debates, how they've shaped not only our understanding here in America of economics, but also the world. We'll begin with a look at the debates between Jean-Jacques Rousseau and John Locke. That'll be our session for today. Our next session will be exploring the work of Adam Smith and the foundations of capitalism. That will be followed by a response from Karl Marx and his fellow travelers looking at the origins of socialism. We'll conclude in our fourth session by looking at the American experience. And after we've set the table with these first three sessions, how are these concepts at work in both the American founding and the American present, our current debates around the role of government, economics, and the individual citizen? I'll be using as text for this work two important books, both co-authored by our main speaker, Dr. Gordon Lloyd. The first is co-written with uh, his partner, Nicholas Capaldi, Liberty and Equality in Political Economy, and the second, The Two Narratives of Political Equ Economy. I invite you to pick up these books, if you'd like, on Amazon to follow along. Suffice it to say, I'll be quoting from these books over the course of these next four sessions. So let's begin our first session in looking at the debates and arguments between John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And who better to lead us in this than our Doxon Professor Emeritus here at the School of Public Policy, Dr. Gordon Lloyd. Dr. Lloyd, great to have you with us. Good morning, Dean Peterson. It's always good to see you, and it's good to be back in the old haunting ground. So before we get into the specifics of the Locke-Rousseau debate, Dr. Lloyd, I want to take a step back and even look at the term political economy. I think for many uh, minds uh, today, as we think about those terms, we separate them into silos. We have politics over here and economics over here. Uh, but for really these classical thinkers, the two of them really melded together. So let's first begin with a discussion of what are the origins of political economy? And then as we go through these two thinkers and the ones to follow, how should we think about the connection between politics and economics? I can remember when I was young and I, was, I did my undergraduate degree at McGill, Montreal. There was a department called the Department of Political Economy. And you were expected to do some economics and do some politics. But no one took seriously the idea that there was an independent field or a, or a joining field called political economy. It was like a leftover from previous days. Mm. And then I went to University of Chicago and it was in economics and I got the quantitative run. However, the offices of the faculty in the political science department and the economics department were on the same floor, mm. which again is a throwback to an earlier day in which you, you, the, the feeling among the intelligentsia was you can't do one without the other. So something happened in the 20th century to make them separate. I think the word is science, that somehow you can do economics as a science, you can put its boundaries, and then hold everything else constant. And as, if you can hold everything else constant, then you can become a scientist. And, and then if you want to, introduce those other things that you've held constant, then you introduce them from outside the field. So that, for example, microeconomics has a very straightforward model that consumption depends upon price, and mm -hmm. you can trace it. But you know very well that consumption could also depend upon income, it could depend upon storms, mm -hmm. it could depend upon, so, so, but you hold that constant. So if there's a storm, then you, then you sort of move the diagram. <laughs> 
But there's a, an input and there's an output and there's a constant. That's very scientific, which means that there's, some, there's a field called economics, which can be studied in and of itself, holding politics, for example, aside. But well, political science tried to copy that and become a science, which meant it's a study of power or a study of the preferences of voters for candidates. And then you can hold other things constant, like income or ethnicity or whatnot, and you can bring them in. Well, some people are down the line are going to say, how can you hold ethnicity constant? How can you hold identity constant? So there's going to be now uh, a field called identity politics or identity studies mm -hmm. or such and such. So therefore, the key variable is one's identity, and holding politics and economics constant. And if politics and economics change, then you can shift the diagram. But if you can't draw it, then it's not a science. Mm -hmm. If you can't put an input and an output, then it's not a science. Now, it may be a dismal science, like <laughs> economics is, is called, or a pretended science, like politics is called. So I think part of the separation is due to the creation of separate disciplines with their own subject matter and their own input and their own output, which you can teach independently of other things. So you can hold ethics constant, mm -hmm. religion constant. Now, so I think that's the separation, is science and 20th century methodology. If we go back to the Greeks where the original word O economics came from, it was the, it was the economy of the household. So in a sense, the Greeks held it separate. There was something called the management of the household which was bread and butter and whatever else. Mm -hmm. And then there was the outside, which, which was something called politics, which was serious. It, it was not just household stuff. But that's why you had slaves. That's why you had various people who couldn't have the leisure mm. to study the big things in life and chat, chat around about war and peace and that everything. So it says politics was higher mm. than economics because it was, it was subject, the subject of people of leisure who could study the stars, who could study this, that, and the other, and read books, whereas managing the household is a task from morning to night to clean, to, to boil eggs, to do this and do the other. Well, so that's, in that sense, it was also separate, but you could study it, and you could say there were certain more natural economic activities and less economic activities. Well, I think that somewhere in between the ancients and the 20th century, there's much to talk about in terms of the relationship, again, as you've introduced it. And I would say that um, politics was still, uh, uh, excuse me, economics was, was, was still sort of a handmaiden because what, what price should we charge for this commodity? And the answer becomes, well, what is the fair price? Or what is the just price? Or mm. what is the equitable price? Well, then you have to have morality to determine what is just and what is not just. So it was not the market that decided. It was the church fathers or the continuing morality or nationalism, which would say that the important part is the political relationship between nations, the such and such within this polity, and therefore, economics must take a back seat, and we will charge this price. And this is a minimum wage, or this is a maximum price, and this is such and such. So that politics became involved in the role of trading, partly, as I say, for mercantilist, nationalist reasons, partly for just reasons. I think the reason why we start at our story with Locke and Rousseau is that they took economics out, well, let's just take Locke for the moment. Locke took economics out of the household, hmm. which means he brought it into the public sphere. So Locke could talk about political economy in terms of an important, it's the economy, stupid, important part of the political life of a nation is the well-being of a nation. But you cannot have the well-being of a nation unless people are sufficiently well off. So the economics come to the forefront, and political economy then is understanding what the role of government is in controlling this new beast that has left the household, 
but has only left the household because we want to improve the human condition. So now a whole logic or a whole philosophy now has to develop and defend this notion of political economy. Rousseau uses the term political economy in the same, in the same way as sort of Locke does, but he comes to a different conclusion and a different kind of relationship which we were going to say. When you get to Adam Smith in 1776, he starts off book four saying, political economy is. And it is, what is it? It's the job of the statesman to understand how uh, prices work, how they should work, how financial markets work. And Smith comes to the conclusion that it's virtually impossible for the statesman to know all of these things. So we're better off leaving it to something called the market. Mm. Uh, in the Federalist Papers, the question was, what should the members of Congress know? What kind of knowledge should they bring to represent their people? And the answer is explicit with Hamilton and nearly explicit with Madison is that they should know how the economy works the financial markets, um, what it is that people uh, want, need, and bread and butter and everything. Uh, but it's fairly similar to Smith, th there, is a, th there is a concern that individuals by themselves don't have the knowledge or the equipment to do this. So we're better off leaving it to competition, com competitive forces. Mm. And then you get into, say, the 19th century and the, the uh, birth of socialism, which suggests that society has, should have more of a say over markets, etc., because then there's poverty here and there's unequal resources here. So that what we need, and the political economy, in a sense, changes to becoming social economy. Mm -hmm linked to social philosophy, in which the condition of the society itself becomes a major concern. Capital S society. Capital S society, in which you then get, from which you can get socialism, which is the doctrine. Agency is its doctrine. And so it's the doctrine of society, which suggests that, um, that political economy should become social economy. Hmm. Um, it doesn't mean to say the politics disappears, but the old idea, so that you get, now you get planning. You get the, the idea of, 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 of not just a statesman deciding, but somebody who has a PhD in this can decide. <laughs> and I think what has happened to the word political, if we bring it right up to the 20th century, uh, shall we say democracies, et cetera, have, have accepted the specialization aspect have accepted the division between economics and, and politics in the academy. And the people who now do political economy, if you were to go to schools and say, let's take political economy, you're really going to take almost Marxism. So that, that I, mean, there's a, I mean, we could spend the entire time here not even talking about Locke and Rousseau, but just what the question that you've answered. But I've tried to put Locke and Rousseau within that story. There's a story before Locke and Rousseau, and there's a story after Locke and Rousseau. But we have to start somewhere. So we'll be going back into the 17th century with Locke, moving into the 18th century with Rousseau. The ideas that they both espoused are timeless, very much related to human nature. But at the time, the same time, they're also making arguments in context to the particular periods in where they're, where they're living and working. So why don't we begin with Locke. Tell us a little bit about the time frame in which he was living, a little bit more about him, and how that context led to many of the arguments that he made. Yeah, that's a very, very good question, and it raises a, it raises a, a riddle. And, and the riddle is, do ideas have consequences, or do consequences have ideas? Mm. It's, mm. it's do, uh, uh, it's, it's, one of the twists or turns in the 19th century is the doubt that what we see around us is the result of uh, human and that 
uh, and there, there's something else going on. So, so you get, you get to, um, for example, Descartes. I think, therefore I am. If you get to Marx, I am, therefore I think. Mm. So the question you're raising is a riddle. Do circumstances create ideas? In other words, can we understand Locke simply by understanding his time? Or is Locke in some sense an independent thinker or a person who can extract from his own time for a little bit and say something that might be valuable for a later time so that later people can come back and pick it up? If we're determined by our circumstances, then there's no sense studying Locke. Although I would say, I think, as we'll see as we go through each of these thinkers, certainly Locke and Rousseau in this first session, that they are asking timeless questions yes. about human nature, yes. about the role of God, right? There's a religious dimension to this, or there doesn't have to be, but at least that question is considered within it. And so I think it can be both, right? Yes. I mean, it could be said that circumstances trigger ideas that trigger other circumstances. Yes. Right? That it's a continuing thing. So let's then explore Locke both in his circumstances because when we go to Rousseau, he's going to be responding to Locke. Not yes. But at the same time, he's also responding to how he perceives the circumstances. Yes. Well, uh, okay. <clears throat> I am not. I'm not denying that circumstances have an effect, and I think it's quite right to put the put things in context. So I think what what what, what makes it difficult is that both variables are working, mm -hmm. which makes it very difficult for political scientists and economics in the 20th century. You have to take one or the other, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, the circumstance in England in the late 16, in the late 17th century was the result of previous circumstances, which, in, which includes uh, a civil war in the 1640s, the chopping off of a monarch's head. In 1660, the restoration of the monarchy. In the 1660s, a plague and a fire, and the burning down of London. And 16... Uh, in, in, in the 1680s, the arrival of uh, King James II on the throne. He was a devout Catholic, and he intended to, to shift the pendulum back in this whole 200 years of the role of Catholicism, the birth of Anglicanism, the, uh, the, and what is the role of the state in the church, and what is the role of the church in the state. And you get to the 18, 1680s in James II, and there is a decision which is made um, to, to invite him to go to, to the continent. Mm -hmm. And in turn, not do away with the monarchy, but instead to invite uh, James's daughter, Mary, uh, with her husband, William, from Orange, to come over, and that, that is extremely important because Locke was in exile during this period of time because he was, a, a, um, he certainly wasn't church, as they say in England. <laughs> he might have been chapel. <laughs> it, it was either Anglican, I mean, and this is a really interesting, can you be Anglican, can, it, can, it, can be neither Anglican nor Catholic, but a Christian? Yes. And so, so Locke's, uh, understanding was there was room, uh, there's room on the earth for more than, the, so he wrote an essay on toleration. I mean, essay on toleration is religious toleration. So for 200 years, Britain did not have religious toleration. And Locke couldn't write openly, otherwise he'd lose his head. Uh, <clears throat> a contemporary of him, of his, known as Algernon Sidney, who was very big for the, for the, for, for the founding fathers, and as you say, looking back mm -hmm. to see what kind of ideas are universal uh, we can pick out from that circumstance and apply to ours. Algernon Sidney was a hero, but Algernon Sidney also lost his head. There was no such thing as free speech in 1680s. 
um, but no one was willing to go far enough to create a revolution. And it's within that context of religious freedom, the role of the economy, what kind of politics we're going to have, and that's the birth of the English Bill of Rights. So they invite William and Mary, but thou shalt not be a tyrant, either of you. Mm -hmm. So we have an English Bill of Rights, which then gets handed down to the American experience with the emphasis being on due process. And that becomes extremely important, process. How we go about doing things. Not, it, it, what we do matters, but how we do it matters. So you get these various steps and stages and the right to counsel, etc. So in that say, politics, religion, and economics were tied together. And that is coming out of the household. Mm -hmm. And the circumstances are this religious and political turmoil. And, uh, and, and, that's the, and sort of that is the, is, I would say, the most important circumstance. So Locke has to start off saying, is, is monarchy natural? So the word natural comes in to be a measure rather than what the church says. So there's this exploration, not just of human nature, but nature itself. Mm. Because you can't talk about human nature unless we understand nature. And so this, both Rousseau and Locke have this concentration of, of, of say, looking at the nature of things. Right. And, and to put it in context, is monarchy natural? That is, whereas in fact, if you become like Locke and say it's not natural, then it becomes very, very sort of say earthly that how did James II become king? Well, because his brother died. <laughs> well, of course, that's natural. People mm -hmm. die. But mm -hmm. at the same time, he didn't earn it. Mm. He inherited it. Mm. And so there's this story. is inheritance of land, which is economics, of, of power, which is politics, and, uh, uh, and ethics, which is religion. Uh, all of those things, there's a certain tradition of inheritance. And that it is right because that's the way it's been. And then if we break that norm, we're in chaos. Mm -hmm. And so Locke starts talking about, is feudalism natural? Is monarchy natural? And, and this is how he, that's why he writes an essay on toleration. He writes an essay dealing with, uh, with politics and economics. And he, writes, and he writes a separate one dealing with economics where the economic question becomes important. But I think that's the circumstance that you ask. Yes. And so in responding to that, Locke has a particular understanding of not only human nature, but the systems around which human liberty or freedom can be understood. And so when we get to the subject of economics, one of the things I think it's important to ground this initial conversation between Locke and Rousseau is their perceptions of the right political economic systems derive from their perception of human nature and how it is formed within those systems. For Locke, he is arguing from a place where he's looking back at man originally Adam and Eve and the biblical account and what happened after the fall and the understanding that at least in the biblical account work is seen as a curse Locke turns that slightly to say that work could actually be seen as a blessing certainly something that is given by God to man again with a capital M uh, to essentially engage with the world that God had created to refine it and improve it. Talk a little bit about the origin story for Locke, which is grounded in that biblical account. Well, that's very good. Um, if you're going to try to understand nature as opposite to convention, I mean, why do we have the monarchy? Because we've always had it. That's convention. Doesn't mean you see it's right. Oh yes, it does because it's always been here. Therefore, okay. But what Locke does 
in his approach to nature over against convention is to introduce something called the state of nature. And it's, this, it's an abstract understanding that, so that in the beginning, human beings were without convention. I mean, I think that's the important part. So what were they with? Well, uh, they had the right to life. Mm -hmm. And this was natural. This was by nature. That is something in human beings which attempt to preserve themselves and exist. Like all animals, there's a certain sense of self-preservation. So Locke begins with that premise. Now, there, there's, a, but there's an alternative story, which, as you say, is, the, uh, is Genesis, about how we came into being and all of that kind of sense of our response. So that Locke, in effect, has to deal with that. Because that's the traditional story. And it may have led, in Locke's mind, it did, to a certain understanding of feudalism, monarchy, and the church. A certain understanding. It could be a wrong understanding, but that's where that understanding begins. So he has to take that on because somebody's going to say, well, what about the God? He's going to say, well, there's this famous paragraph 34 in which, in which Locke says, God gave the world to humans in common. So he accepts that there is a, he accepts that there is a God, mm -hmm. whether for, for um, uh, simply purposes of getting through his audience, because if he says there's no God, then I think he might as well shut the book and, 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 and count the days until you're being hung. <laughs> so that even, even if it's just for, for rhetorical purposes. Mm -hmm. And this becomes a big question in Locke's scholarship. Is Locke being rhetorical in order to survive where Sidney did not, or is he being uh, accurate? Mm -hmm. Because, as you say, according to Locke, God gave the world to the humans in common, but he did not give it to them. Uh, he did not give it to the, to, to the lazy mm. and, and the uh, contentious. Mm. He gave it to those who are irrational and industrious. Mm. And so that work or work or labor or picking your own berries, et cetera, is not stealing, but as long as it is the result of your own initiative, then God is going to bless that and because you're rational and you're industrious. The question becomes, is ra are the rational and industrious the few mm. or are they the many? And there's a, content, there's a difference of understanding. I mean, if, if you say that Locke is, is, if you say that it's just the few, then you could argue that Locke is really making a new case for an oligarchy, which is better than the old case, which is in front of you, which is crumbling. Mm -hmm. If you say that the rational and industrious are the many, then you can say that Locke is making a new case for something that really doesn't quite exist yet, which is democracy. And so how you interpret that paragraph is extremely important. Going back to the Adam and Eve story, it's that it, 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 is it possible? And this is something that's really bothered me over the years, and I don't have, a, don't have an answer. I, I have hunches. OK, uh, serious scholars have have made the argument. I mean, if you're a religious scholar, let's just say you're a, you're a scholar who takes Judaism seriously. Say you're a scholar that takes Catholicism seriously, and it's very difficult for, to, for you to get out of your Judean mm -hmm. uh, Catholic. But you're going to be fair, right? You're going to be you're going to try and recreate Locke as 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 uh, as you wanted to be recreated. But at the same time, you, you're, you're approaching the text in a certain way. And there have been Catholic and Jewish scholars who don't take Locke seriously, who mm. think that all of this stuff is just pablum, surface. And so their challenge to the reader is, if we were to take religion and all out of that stuff, and you, just, just take it out of Locke, mm -hmm. just to, to, right, redact. Would we land up with the same theory mm. of, of, of you? Right, you follow what I'm getting at? Yes. Um, 
And so the people who have, um, who say, what well, I've challenged on that, right? And they usually come out to be Protestant. And I'm wondering whether there's a Protestant reading of Locke. I mean, say all three are being fair. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just from a perspective. But they're being fair, but certain lines and certain words strike you differently. Right. So that uh, two people whom I admire, so no, that say, no, no, that's a Protestant reading of Locke. I mean, I mean excuse me, say to me, yeah, there's nothing in there which suggests, according to Protestant, that, that work is something bad. That Locke has provided, say, a, a, a secular message. Yeah, we take him seriously. God does exist. God did do this. Therefore, the, the state of nature argument from Locke is not separate from the traditional understanding of God, but it is a Protestant understanding, or it is compatible with Protestantism. Mm -hmm. But even to the point where Locke could be part of the Protestant movement. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So that you've got, it, 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 really, what I've been saying here, it goes back to your original point about circumstances and ideas, that uh, I think when you read a text, you try to be fair, at least a scholar, try to be fair. But I, th I think it's very difficult for you just to say that every word is going to be treated in the same way by every scholar. All very good points, Dr. Lloyd. Let's take Locke at his word that he grounds his understanding of political economy in that origin story of Adam and Eve after the fall, that work is something given to us by God to interact with the creation, with the world that he has given to all mankind. Following that, Locke then takes the next step around some understanding of private property. And I wanted to quote from this one uh, passage here on page five of your book, Liberty and Equality in Political Economy. Quote, God inspired labor, created something that was not already there, namely new resources. These resources constitute the theoretical defense of private property. This property, therefore, is a natural right given by God and does not require legitimation by government. Talk a little bit about this transition now that Locke is making from work as being a blessing from God, then connecting that to an understanding of private property. Yes. Well, to go back to that famous paragraph 34, God gave the world to man in common. Right. Um, I don't think you have to be a Catholic, a Jew, or a Protestant to say that in the beginning, there was no private property. I think everybody could agree on that, right? That's what Locke means. Mm -hmm. So why didn't this communism, quotation marks, mm -hmm. continue? And the, an the answer is that God gave the world so that man could develop it and make it his own. So that man, it's not that God uh, cursed Adam and Eve, he provided the outcome for a right life. Mm. And the right life is self-reliance, going out and picking the berries and digging the fields. But if God gave the world to man in common, how can you, how can you go out and dig the fields and, and take it, take it from the commons? The tragedy of the commons, as many people say, and, and the answer is, because God expected you to provide for your, for your life. And you can't provide for your life unless you're free to go out and dig it. And what makes that correct is that you're not hurting anybody else. You're providing for yourself, and therefore it should be yours. So private property is taking from the commons, privatizing it privatizing that which is common. And so Locke had to make this justification for private property because the assumption was that, that private property was always given through inheritance. Mm. That, right? So the justification for, pri 
for, for, for privatizing was inheritance to the landlord, etc., or from government. So where do you, if we were to ask the modern question, where do you get your rights from? Uh, um, Locke would answer from nature and from nature's God. Oh, we, I mean, is it the biblical God? And then we get back into that question, is the biblical God the same as nature's God? And one might say, well, uh, how do you read the Bible? And how do you read these, these paragraphs again? So we're back into that, that issue. But I think Locke's point is, that it is natural to preserve yourself. But you cannot preserve yourself unless you work, because that becomes a beggar. And Locke is trying to provide a system, I think, it, which is something new newish, which is that you have the right to take care of yourself. And as long as you work, and it's honest labor, mm -hmm. then you have the right to the fruits of your, of your labor. And so he's establishing a right to private property, which was at best um, only, only winked at in the past. So one of the contributions of Locke is to make, a, in a sense, a full throttled full uh, uh, defense mm -hmm. of private property, which is based in nature and nature's God with a biblical understanding, which people can disagree with. Mm -hmm. But, but his, his point is that that um, private property is an, and is an important part, and you have to explain it. And the question becomes, has Locke provided a, a, a good enough explanation for why people should privatize and own it? And should they then own it forever? And, and for me, the real challenge, and I don't know this, it's not because, say, I'm a Protestant or Catholic or Jewish, but when I read it, I read it so now Locke, you've given me a real challenge. You've provided a, a moral foundation for private property. That is, property is not based on inheritance or convention, it's based on your own labor and your own work. Mm -hmm. What happens when you die? Mm. Well then, I guess somebody inherits your property. Mm -hmm. Your children they inherit your property, but they didn't work for it. Mm. Uh, so what happens to the theory that private property is justified by one's own labor, and then aren't you then getting into a, a different kind of inheritance theory as to what the, from what the beginning is? So I think the Achilles heel here is what, I mean, why should your children inherit your property? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is because it is yours and you can do with it what you will, mm -hmm. as, right? And your children are part of you. Right. That's right. And therefore, they, so I think that would, have, that, that would be the defense I would come up with. Mm -hmm. But I think the real challenge now is no longer, has it been in the past? Well, what happens in the future? Because Locke is on a path breaking, and one can understand in his time, for his generation, why this model of you have a right to private property works. Before we make the transition from the economic to the political, from economy to a conception of government in Locke. I wanted to see if we could pull apart this nexus that has been created over the centuries uh, between work, private property, and selfishness. Certainly as we get into Rousseau, we're going to see a more, if you will, a community-minded approach to economics. But it's not fair, I don't believe, to say that Locke was viewing private property as purely a selfish, self-centered possession. In fact, Locke also had a conception of community and how this work around private pro property better served a community approach. I wanted to pull this one quote you have, again, on page five. More importantly, we have an obligation to improve the material circumstances of others, but not through redistribution. Rather, the improvement of others is the result of our self-improvement. So Dr. Lloyd, talk a little bit about how Locke's conception of work and private property actually could be seen as being aligned with a community 
focused, interested approach. One of the issues is, uh, of Locke's theory is not only what I mentioned, or what happens to the next, next time, I mean, what happens to the inheritance, but also, um, the, the idea is that you can, at the beginning anyway, you can go and plow and do whatever it is, uh, and take from it what you, what you need. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's enough left over for others. Well, um, as, as the population grows and people start working, so the story starts unfolding, um, this idea of self-preservation uh, encourages human beings to think that how far shall I go in preserving myself? Okay, well, pretty far. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you, and you sort of uh, gather a surplus of, of these. Uh, so are you going to wait? So waste. Mm becomes a very, a very important moral vice in Locke. Um, and, and so you must do something with it. And it, it, I don't think it's so much benevolence, but it's because you have this surplus and you're still interested in yourself, you look around and say, you know, I have enough meat, but I don't have a house to put it in or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you approach somebody on your own initiative. It's not that somebody comes and begs you, but you on your own initiative, you seek out the assistance of others. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, these others come to you and offer their own labor. And in offering you their own labor, they expect to receive a recompense. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the ways that Locke and economists explain this is try to explain this at the beginning without, without the intervention of money. Mm -hmm. So it's a trading. So you're trading, uh, I'm going to trade you food for labor, will work for food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, right, uh, it's, it's nothing begging, mm -hmm. right? And so by doing that, by... Um, Locke says, I'm actually improving the life of others. And it may not be out of benevolence, but, but then it becomes sort of linked to the Christianity understanding. It becomes a, a, a part of this obligation. And that's what's getting at what, I was, what, what Kapali and I were getting at in this book. It becomes extremely difficult to unravel that which comes from pure selfishness, but somehow leads to the benefit of others. Mm -hmm from, I have an obligation to actually feed, clothe, and house other people as some kind of, of God-obligated task. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so I presented both sides on this, right? So yes. I, I, I think, again, it depends on how you read Locke. I would think that Locke, my understanding is basically that it's out of a concern for self that you become concerned for others. Mm. Right now, all I could say that's biblical. You have to do unto others mm -hmm. as you would have do unto oneself. And then we get back into the argument again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why, do, why, you know, it's, why do we have to come back to this self? Well, the answer is because the self is the center of the universe, or the God given self mm -hmm. is the center of the universe. It's not the state, mm -hmm. it's not government, but it's the self. There's a natural self. Now that natural self doesn't have to be simply greed. But there is some mechanism, maybe God-inspired, God-required. There's some mechanism that by providing for myself, I provide for others. And in that, then others come to me and then they're providing for themselves. Things. So there's no real clash between self and others as modern uh, philosophers want to what to say, the, the other, the self, mm -hmm. the such and such. It works out as a system. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a natural system. And what helps in this development is, is, is linked to the following question. Well, what happens if you've accumulated 
so many berries and your stomach can only hold, say, half the amount of berries, you're going to have waste. And that is, uh, <laughs> whether it's related to some Protestant teaching or related to some natural teaching, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's wrong to waste. Mm -hmm. So in that obligation, then you trade. But what happens if you, people out there don't want berries? Mm -hmm. Right? They, they, they want apples. But you don't have any apples. Ah! Money comes into existence, and what money does is to solve the spoilage problem. Very good. And of course, later on, it's refrigeration. <laughs> but well, how money solves it? <laughs> the spoilage problem is that the, the, the Apple man will take your money or whatever it right. is and then use the money. So money becomes known as a medium of exchange and it's part of a natural order, which is developed. So you start off in the beginning sort of very uh, uh, primitive. Mm -hmm. but, but as you develop this primitive story into something approaching um, a, a modern uh, story, that there are stages along the way that you have, to, or hurdles along the way that you have to, get. and so to, when does something become just simply power rather than nature? And so it leads up, up all through this until one understands that unfortunately, there are some greedy people. Mm -hmm. And these greedy people are operating against nature and against God because they're not working for something, they're going to steal it from you. Mm -hmm. And out of self-preservation, somehow, this becomes another issue, that somehow people understand for their own self-preservation, they need to associate with others in a community. So it's not, say, natural that I become you know, community-minded and bury myself in the community. It's rather I become very concerned with the preservation of self, the whole idea of self. So the community I join has to be by my consent. And imagine that Locke, if we talk about separation of powers, that Locke, in the beginning, human beings have legislative power, executive power, and judicial power in their own self. So the question is, how is it natural that when we get to the political arena, the governmental arena, we are giving up. So what do we give up and what do we retain? So let's go there next, and we still have to get to Rousseau. Sure, well, well this is getting to him. Right. Yes. But, so let's go there. Let's, let's make the transition now between the economy as Locke perceived it to the necessary government design construction that would be necessary to facilitate this type of economy to in some way create the conditions by which uh, this type of economy that had within it private property and money could most easily exist. Well, since government is not natural, it has to be created. And the creation, the creation story with government is that human beings create government. And so the role of government is to secure those rights. This is the basic foundation of government. Is to secure those rights um, which were, let me say, um, either unprotected or, or in jeopardy before there was government. So that government is going to be, in a sense, limited. It's going to be limited to that the right, the, the obligation of government is, is to secure these basic rights which are insecure in the state of nature. But it doesn't mean to say I'm going to give up all my rights. And, and, in fact, so out of the right to life, liberty, and property, or if we, so, so there's going to be a, a conversation there as uh, property is the last one you give up. I mean, I remember the old Jack Benny story when a robber approaches him. Right, you know, I'm talking about Jack Benny. Oh, yeah. Right, right. A robber approaches him, you know, your money or your life. 
I said, your money or your life. And Jack Ryan, he says, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> well, so what, the, the property question becomes extremely important. So, so the way it's then written into the British American constitutions is a way of trying to deal with the fact that you don't give up all your property is that government can only take property for public use. And that becomes a big question in the issue. What constitutes public use uh, with just compensation? So this just compensation notion is an obligation on government if property is taken. And so the argument then becomes through the, the next 200 years, well, what is just compensation? What is public use? But at least there's a theory placed down that, government, that, that, that your right to property doesn't depend upon government, that the, it's an obligation of government to, to say why your property is being taken from you particularly if your property is earned by your own labor. So that's one. That's, secondly, Locke is aware that <laughs> from history, from his own circumstances, and from the way his, 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 his story is unfolding, that power can corrupt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, political power can corrupt. So that what you need is to separate powers in government. So not only do you limit the government in terms of its objectives to secure that which was insecure, so the government is limited, but all the better to restrain the corrupting abilities, uh, the corrupting aspects of, of accumulating power that you, you don't want all power, you want, don't want power to be accumulated in, all, in one hand. Because that's, again, it goes back to monarchy. Mm -hmm. or it goes back to aristocracy. So you want a separation of powers. And the most important branch to deal with is the legislature. And the assumption is then, what shall the legislature do? It shall make laws. Right. Pertaining to what? Um, that which we, should, we could not accomplish uh, w without. And so, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean to say that the government is going to then take care of us, because then it goes back to the Locke's Bible, where, where um, we take care of ourselves. There is no government. I mean, that's the whole point of Locke's state of nature. There is no aristocracy. There is no monarchy. There is no pope. There's, there's, there's no archbishop. There's just us individual chickens. <laughs> going out there, doing God's will, protecting ourselves, helping our neighbor through the acquisition of money. And then government comes in as securing as close as possible to that natural state. It's a facilitator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. government is a facilitator, yes. It's also a protector, mm -hmm. but not an instigator. Very in good. that sense of what you mean by facilitate. Yeah, it doesn't have a life of its own. In fact, for Locke, and this is a very controversial part in Locke, and it comes into the American conversation, including today, is that Locke has to answer his quest, a question, and he does. And the question is, well, what happens if there's an emergency? This all sounds very good when there is no war. Mm -hmm. Locke, how can you be, how do you can be so, silly because your state of nature was a state of peace in the beginning, but then it became a state of war. That's why you had government. So I said, war disappeared? And the answer is no. Well, if it's at, on at home, then you, can, you have the law, you have the police, you have the whatever it is that you deal with. Well, what happens if foreign invasion? What happens if such as, what happens if the legislature can't get together in time? It's not an executive job. And so Locke introduces uh, a, what I would think is a very touchy subject. And the touchy subject is, uh, can this democratic nation, based on a legislature, be ready to defend itself in, in emergency attacks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Locke says, in that regard, every government, and Hamilton follows him, in that regard, the government that I'm talking about has 
inherent power to preserve itself. Just like individuals have the power to preserve themselves, government has the power to preserve itself. Of course that can be abused, and that's another question. But according to the way in which this is developed, government hasn't, you're not presented that government has a right to self-preservation. So that's where you get the executive. I think, and then the executive will have emergency powers. Inherent. Inher that gov every government inherently has the right to self-preservation, and that power to self-preservation is going to be reside in the executive. Well, what if the executive makes an error? Let me get into a next question. How do you do that? And they, or maybe we'll, uh, on one of our sessions, we'll have the chance to talk about this government question with regard to the American system. Does the Constitution contain uh, the power of self-preservation? Um, and where would that power lie? Uh, it's all well and good to see this Constitution, but working in a time of peace, but what about a time of emergency? And is emergency the natural way of life? Or is peace the natural way of life, which is, which is from time to time, is uh, infringed upon by a, a bad apple here, a rotten apple there, a disgusting apple there, but there's nothing wrong with the system. Right. It's the, it's the apples. <laughs> Why don't they eat, let them eat berries? <laughs> Well, let's transition to Rousseau. Okay. Now, historically, we're now jumping ahead around 70 or 80 years. We're now in the mid 18th century. Let's look at Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, and, and do the same thing as we did again with Locke. Let's talk a little bit about the environment in which he was working, what he was responding to. Now, unlike Ra Locke, who did not have Rousseau to respond to. Uh, Rousseau now has Locke to respond to. Talk a little bit about the period in which Rousseau was working and was there any engagement uh, directly between Rousseau and Locke? Yeah, well, the reason why I set them like that, even though uh, historically, there may be very few, I mean, the one, Locke won't quote Rousseau, and so this is because of the obvious notion of um, Locke was, uh, Rousseau wasn't born. Right. So, I mean, that's a, a natural circumstance. Uh, but did Rousseau quote Locke? I, there, if any, I have really seen it in Rousseau's work, it doesn't mean to say it's not there, but I think Rousseau, Locke, Rep represents the case, by the time it gets to Rousseau 600, yeah, six, six, 60, 70 years later, whatever, the, the case, uh, Locke has made the case are for the development of the arts and sciences. And in that regard, government can provide assistance to the useful arts and, and, and productive sciences um, through, or, through the offering of patents. That's not a, right, for a, for a limited period of time, says the Constitution. Now, then we get into what is limited, and such and such, and yeah, right. But it's an encouragement of the arts and sciences. And Rousseau is living in a time when the arts and sciences in the in this 18th century are starting to flourish. In, in certainly they're flourishing in Britain, and they're flourishing in British America. And so there's a question that is, that is not quite haunting Europe yet, but is beginning to appear in Europe, is that the arts and sciences are now challenging the status quo. Well, this, is what, this is what happens, right? If you've got a plow and it, beforehand, all you did was to get on your knees and pick the corn or do such and such. Now you've got a, a machine coming in, a useful art and science coming in, plowing, and they could do it one day, but it would take you a whole year. And, and that story of, of the introduction of machinery, mm -hmm. the introduction of, um, of, of these uh, assistants, so machinery becomes a natural thing for Locke. 
machinery becomes a potential challenge for Rousseau, that because it's taking away what we had before. Uh, you look at my level, people are arguing about, you know, you, you, we don't want to become like Laguna Beach, mm -hmm. right? We want the, the, the village look, we want such and such, just this, that, and the other. We don't want progress in that sense of progress. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, so the, I think what the, the climate is that the arts and sciences are coming to Europe. And we're not talking about Rembrandt. I mean, that's not the art that, that, that Locke is talking about. Right. Because certainly European art from Italy all the way through to, the, to, to, to France is, it's, it's, quote, far superior, unquote, to that which you see in, in North America anyway. So it's a different kind of art and science that we're talking about. It's, it's the art and science for the masses, in, mm -hmm. in a sense. So mm -hmm. Rousseau is asking, well, so what should people, other than uh, those who don't have to work for a living, and what do they do? And so Rousseau's point is that it's corrupting their lives. It's taking away, and then he comes in with this word, this, their natural livelihood. Mm. That is to which they're used, and what is, what is appropriate for the human condition. Right, so, so, so once again, let's, let's go back to the origin story. We've, we've talked about Locke and his origin story and how that influenced everything that came out of that. Rousseau has a very different origin story. Uh, he, he points to something called the, the noble savage, yes. uh, which again influences so much of the rest of his arguments and, and economic philosophy and political philosophy. Talk a little bit about Rousseau's noble savage and, and that type of origin story. Well, it, what is very interesting is your, is, is your repetition of Rousseau's word, uh, noble savage. As can one imagine an ignoble savage? <laughs> and I think in Locke, and this is one of the challenges for, shall, shall we say, liberalism, which is emphasizing liberty, the enlightenment, which is part of Locke, all of that stuff, part, part of it, is that they have, the, the enlightenment folks have no problem defending the enlightenment as superior to monarchy, to aristocracy, to the papacy, and to poverty, because poverty is the natural condition at which the Enlightenment sees. So poverty is the problem to be solved, mm -hmm. but people can solve it themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. And Rousseau would, have, I think, ask the question, well, what's wrong with poverty? Why, why is becoming rich or becoming well off a, a, a desirable objective, a human objective? Doesn't it lead to dressing up as button-down shirts? I mean, what's wrong with uh, just a straightforward... Right? I mean, why do we have to uh, pretend? Why do we, why do we... Why do clothes become so important? Well, because they are. It's an expression. Um, so Rousseau would say, look, there's something noble about the savage life. The Enlightenment presents the savage life as something to be overcome. That's why they call it savage. It's not enlightened. Mm -hmm. And the Americans are, interpret that. And it, can be, and it can be interpreted, and it was interpreted, not only to mean savage in the sense of underdeveloped, but savage in the sense of the Native American Indians. There's a, there is a, an approach across the world. One of the downsides, it seems to me, the Enlightenment, that it doesn't answer properly. What do you do with those who are unenlightened or haven't arrived yet? at this stage of development. So it becomes, it is a, a big argument within the Enlightenment. Should the Enlightenment be part of that which tolerates those who are not enlightened? Or is it part of the Enlightenment to go out and make those unenlightened enlightened? And you can see that is linked to Christianity mm -hmm. with missionaries mm -hmm. that overseas. That do, they, I mean, do they go out there to reassure that, they live, that these savages are living the right? Or do they convert them? Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is a, you know, Rousseau, would, he says, that's the story that you're getting into. So there's something noble about the savage life. Right. 
Right, so that's, that's the influence, the impact of the noble savage. But let, let's go back actually into that world. What is, what is the world, that origin story world, that Rousseau is creating? How are people interacting? Um, what, is, what does that world look like? It was simple. It was free. It was pleasant. Uh, people sort of liked each other as they as got a, but there was no this ingrained hostility. There was none of this ingrained. Well, I'm trying to keep up with the Dow Joneses. <laughs> There's that. I mean, there was not that kind of. Uh, I'm comp- going to compare my life with your life to see whether my life is better than yours. So it's the simple life of peace. And and they, they usually eat grains. Mm-hmm. Um, Rousseau goes through some kind of anthropological trying to, trying to understand um, why human beings ought to be vegetarian, and the answer is because of the nature of their teeth, that they don't have the teeth that carnivores have. Therefore, it's not natural. Mm. And so there's a different understanding of nature. Nature is much more peaceful than, than fruit. So what makes then the world unpeaceful? How do we come to war? And the Enlightenment has a lot to do with it in Rousseau. And so in the beginning, man was born free, but now is everywhere in chains. So instead of the Enlightenment bringing... Um, taking people out of prison and poverty lock. It now takes people out of peace and, and, and puts them in chains. And the chains are imposed by a few who have the advantage and they keep you in chains. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't want to leave the, the origin story just yet because I think it actually is a helpful point of comparison between Rousseau and Locke. I, I think it's fair to say, although I certainly want you're thinking on it, that Locke is painting an origin story picture of Adam and Eve after the fall, that there is some understanding that there can be a tendency towards selfishness, that we are, we are operating in a world where there can be a degree of suspicion that collaboration and partnership may not be the, the natural predisposition of man, when we get to Rousseau, it feels like, although he would never use those term, these terms, I understand, but he would be thinking about man pre-fall, that he would be thinking about Adam and Eve in the garden. And in that, do you, do you think that that's a way that we can understand or compare Locke and Rousseau? One is mankind pre-the fall, in that state of nature, that's the noble savage, whereas Locke is thinking about man after the fall, where work has been placed both as a curse and blessing upon mankind. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I like that. Like, I mean, one point I'd raise is that I don't think Locke's biblical story can be taken separately from the state of nature. I think his state of nature is part of a biblical story, if yes. you want to say that. And right. that's, and I'm, I'm there on that. So okay. I guess what I'm so saying... What, what, there's no biblical story in the, in the equivalent in Rousseau. That's right. Although, if you wanted to make it equivalent, is it fair then to say that Rousseau's conception, again, would never use the Adam and Eve or the biblical imagery, but would it be fair to say that the noble savage is, is in some way mankind pre-fall, to in some way make the connection between the Locke biblical narrative and what could be perceived to be a at least in the same terms, a biblical narrative in Rousseau's understanding. Okay, now you see here. Here's where uh, because, uh, the, the biblical story becomes again very interesting. Uh, if we take Genesis, when you read read the words of Genesis, leaving what we have behind, just read the words of Genesis. Uh, is the fall due to some notion of loss of innocence? That, that somehow um, the serpent uh, 
is a temptation. And I don't know where knowledge fits, quite fits into this story, but, uh, but you are quite, um, yes, disobedience comes in. Um, the acquisition of how do you eat the apple? You, darn it, you've eaten the berries. <laughs> you, you eat the apple, and then the fall arrives. Or you dis it's not the eating of the apple, but it's the disobeying of God. Which is, now, it seems to me that although there is no explicit God in Rousseau, at this, at this stage, God comes in later in the form of the state mm -hmm. and the community. But in this stage, it's simple. People don't have cunning. People are not interested in knowledge. And so the, the, the biting of the apple has to come through, the, through some notion of temptation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there have and, to be things to be tempted by. Yes, right. Exactly. And, and, um, and, and the Enlightenment offers temptation. I mean, that, I think that's the Rousseau story. And that, and that becomes a challenge of modern life. That, that is, how do I preserve myself morally in a world in which there's so much temptation that how can I possibly avoid the fall? And I think that's part of Rousseau's story. We're simple, we're innocent, we're sensitive. We're not calculating. We're not, in, we're not interested in the poverty question. We're, we're, and so if someone were to ask Locke, where is your natural story? You say, it's in my head. Don't ask me for an explicit example in the world. Truth is not simply by historical or geographical existence. It can be metaphysical. I think, therefore, I am. And what I've thought of is a state of nature. Therefore, it is right. And it's a good explanation to why the mess we got into. But if you have to push me, to, to give a historical, precise example, he, Locke would say, see America. Mm. It is the wilderness. And what is the use of having all this land and it's not plowed? <clears throat> um, so Rousseau, however, would be interested in, in the question, was there ever such a natural condition? Mm. And therefore it becomes the the, the you know, Polynesian islands, the, 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 uh, going back to Australia, mm -hmm. right? The, um, Aborigines. The Aborigines and, the, and the New Zealand. The, uh, uh, Maori. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that, what's wrong with that life? And what corrupted that life? The arrival of the Enlightenment. Mm. And that, what, what? Okay, your head's spinning, right? No, I mean, it's, your questions are very difficult for me, not just because I'm an old man. It's very difficult because you, you ask me, darn you, you're a teacher, you ask me three questions at once. <laughs> you know, and I'm a student, I can't, I can't <laughs> to remember after I get into the first one what the second one was. <laughs> no, I, I think that's the, the basic thing. And so the fall for Rousseau comes with the arrival of temptation of the arts and sciences. But then the question becomes, who, for Rousseau, it's important, who owns those arts and sciences? And I think for Rousseau, he says, unfortunately, a few people, a few people have fooled us simple country folk into doing their bidding so that the social contract, so, Locke, so Locke's understanding of nature is not only wrong. The whole idea of the social contract by which people turn from a state of nature to a state of government and society, um, which is for Locke natural because people consented, Rousseau would say there's no consent involved. It's all force. Yes, yeah, so I, I want to, in, in discussing or thinking about private property, Rousseau obviously has a very different conception of it. And I wanted to pull this quotation, um, page 18 in Liberty and Equality, in which you quote from Rousseau's second discourse. Uh, and so I want to read this directly from Rousseau. 
The first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground to whom it occurred to say, this is mine, was the true founder of civil society. How many crimes, wars, murders, how many miseries and horrors mankind would have been spared by him who, pulling up the stakes or filling the ditch, had cried out to his kind, beware of listening to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits are everyone's and the earth no one's. So again, back to the origin story, much different conception of the relationship between work and private property. Rousseau obviously taking an extremely negative view of private property. Talk a little bit about that uh, perception. It, look, he didn't cite Locke, but isn't that Locke? I mean, we, we don't have to have, where's the citation? <laughs> I mean, that, the first half hour we spent was explaining, was just teasing out exactly what you just said, that private property, tilling the land, beware of the temptation. That's the first, it's right. So, uh, yeah, that, I think that sort of pretty much summarizes Rousseau from, from Locke. So, so that private property, far from being a natural right, is a natural steal. Mm -hmm. Stealing by, by uh, working on the innocence of others. Okay, so, so let's, let's make that transition again, now within Rousseau. And we've described the, the economics, the economic picture, uh, the critiques of Locke. What kind of government or political system then does Rousseau foresee as being necessary to create or facilitate that kind of world. I'll take you again back to a quotation here from the book. Locke would argue that our instinctive affection for others breaks down and we therefore need government. Rousseau feels that people are naturally concerned about others. Yes. So when we move to a discussion specifically around the role of government, I think one of the interesting arguments that we could explore, first going back to Locke, who is often seen as one of the fathers of liberalism and, and uh, capitalism, as we'll discuss uh, later, he actually does see a role for government, albeit limited, but that facilitates a flourishing society. When we get to Rousseau, in some ways, he sees government as something that's actually contributing to the degradation of the noble savage, that it's in some ways part and parcel with this economic system that is uh, causing people to detach from one another, that it's yet another institution to be distrusted. Yes, because it's owned by the few. This notion that, first of all, we didn't create society by consent, it was a fraud. Where the few pull one over us innocence. And so that idea of the fall continues. And the few then own the arts and sciences. And through that, then they own the government. So this notion that the government is a regulator is part of this enlightenment liberalism nonsense. And so the role of government it would have to be rethought in terms of rethinking what the nature of society is. And, the, and, and part of Rousseau's understanding is that, uh, well, <clears throat> you see, this is, is that if we have a sensitivity for others, which is natural sensitivity. It's not that we're with others to improve their, improve their well-being through increasing their wealth. It's just belonging. And that we belong, we, we, we belong, we're a community. And, and, and so what happens to one of us happens to all of us. And so we become a community. It's not that we're, it's, it, it's not like locks I'm interested in myself, and because I'm interested in myself, then I can help others. 
It's that the natural instinct in Rousseau is to be with others. I feel for you. I'm with you. And that, I think, is a, generates a different kind of society and government. In fact, it develops much more, I want to say, of caring. Or, I mean, if the role of government is to come as close to nature as possible, in some sense, Locke's government is going to be limited and help those people take care of themselves, which they would have done in nature. If the whole idea of nature is sensitivity to others, but there's a fall, then it seems to me the role of society and government is to keep that, is to keep that concept alive, to be one. And so I think that's part of the birth of socialism and communism, as at the birth of, the idea of. It's not the individual who comes first and society and government help them to be themselves, to be the best that they could be, but rather society and, and government now become um, an attempt to, to, to help us resist the temptation. Right. So. So now we're beginning to talk about the general will. That's capital G, capital W in, in Rousseau's writing. And I wanted to read this, this one uh, passage from page 20 in discussing this general will. Quote, what each of us agrees to do is to voluntarily submit to the authority of a general will, one in which we are not subordinated to the will of another or to the wills of others, we need not be concerned about getting people to obey this general will because they themselves are the authors of the general will. Yeah. Now, this yeah. sounds rather ominous in yeah. some ways. Yes. But it's, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to understand how the society that Rousseau envisions actually arrives at this will. It seems that, that citizens within the Rousseau society of the general will are both creators of this will itself, but they're also adhering to it. Talk a little bit about this, this tension. Uh, very, very difficult to answer. And it's, and it is confusing as a lot of these ideas are, and it takes time to sort of unmuddle them. Why couldn't they be clearer? <laughs> I know, but why are we so dumb? Why, 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 why could they say so? Anyway, the, I think it has to do with the, how, how, is, how is society created? Because for both Locke and Rousseau, in the beginning, there was no government, there was no society. And so what Locke says, when you join society, you become social. You have, you, you, you give your consent. But that's what make makes the society and the government uh, legitimate. But when you give your consent, you consent to certain things and don't consent to others. You do not consent to give up your right to life. How can you? So that's off the table so be, because that's un, un, unalienable. So there's a certain, it's a debate in Locke between what is unalienable, unalienable or God-given and what you can consent to give away. And you cannot consent in Locke to give your life and you cannot consent in Locke to be a slave. Therefore, I mean, Locke provides one of the earliest, greatest attacks on slavery, even though he invested in the East India Company, et cetera. But that means the, the, the attack on slavery is it is not natural because slavery means I'm giving up my life to you. I'm giving up my right to take care of myself. So slavery is wrong. It's, it's unnatural. So there's the extent that slavery does exist is unnatural. Um, and just because it's been around for centuries doesn't make it right. So there's another attack on the tradition by Locke. Rousseau would argue if you become a member of society, then you've changed your nature. 
You are no longer an individual. Okay. And you're certainly not a calculating one, like mm-hmm. Locke is. Mm-hmm. I'll give this up, I won't give this up. I'll take this, or don't take that. You give up everything. You give up all legislative power. You give up all executive power. You give all judicial power. You give it up. So you have transformed now into a social being. And you're not talking to Locke who would say, okay, end of consent, uh, things have to be done by government, and the closest that it comes to consent is majority rule. So the problem for Locke then is how do I let the majority rule with, 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 and, and yet control the majority from shafting the, the, the minority? So that becomes like a Lockean problem. That problem is not for Rousseau. It's because I'm transformed. Now, how that transformation occurs uh, is a very difficult thing to, I mean, how do I, be, I don't, but it happens. Um, and so we become, so when I'm thinking of, uh, I go, go to a community meeting uh, for Locke, it's, look, I'm looking out for my self-interest, I'm looking out for my community, but I'm uh, sort of agree but verify. Um, and and, and it is that, that notion of, of um, not giving away your judgment mm-hmm. in matters that are extremely important to yourself is there in Locke. In Rousseau, your judgment changes because you now are a transformed human being. You no longer, that, that, que- that Locke question no longer becomes relevant. You're not consenting through majority rule. You're not just counting numbers. The general will is not, an, an, it's not consensus in the sense of I'm counting, or is it bipartisan, because I can find seven people on the other side. It, it's, it's some kind of different, uh, I become one, so when I attend a meeting, I'm actually thinking about your best interest, not my own. Because, because I am now submerged in a community. So that when I ask you, what do you think, I'm going to say, what is best for the community? And I become a communitarian. You know, you would say, well, that's, yeah, to, to doubt that means you're still Lockean. You, have, we, you haven't given up your Lockean calculated yeah, scoundrel. Um, so I think that is very difficult to understand in Rousseau, but it's not, it's not consent in, the, in, in numerical terms. It's a transformation of the human will. So you're not willing what is good for you. You're willing what is good for the society. That's the general will can never be wrong. Well, I believe, Dr. Lloyd, we've, we've really set the table here in this first session uh, for the three that are to follow uh, these, these conceptions of the good society, of how individuals interact with that society, the connection between politics and economics. At the same time, I think you've also highlighted for us the tensions between liberty and equality. Obviously, this is the title of the book that we've been reading from. And so as we move toward concluding this first session, I just wanted to quote this last passage here. Both Locke and Rousseau, this is page 25, both Locke and Rousseau believed in liberty and equality. For Locke, liberty meant restraint on government in the name of natural rights understood to be absolute, do not conflict, and possessed only by individual human beings. Rights are morally absolute or fundamental because they are derived from God. Certainly something that we'll be seeing in our next session with Smith and in our last session as we get to the American experience. Back to the book. For Rousseau, so-called Lockean rights are at best prima facie, may be overridden, and may be possessed by any entity, not just individual human beings. More importantly, Rousseauian liberty entails welfare rights. That is, they may be such that others have a positive obligation to provide goods, benefits, or means. For Locke, equality is equality before the law and equality of opportunity. For Rousseau, equality entails the addition of equality of outcome. Yeah, I don't think that's reading too much. I know that part of the the purpose of that book and our conversation is to lay the groundwork and to examine the relationship between politics and economics. But I think the the meaning of equality changed with Rousseau. And um, 
for Locke, equality is sort of a starting point. Liberty is the end. And for Rousseau, the presence of inequality has to be explained. That for him, inequality is not natural. Inequality is human made. So if it's human made, is it legitimate? Since what we want is the natural state. Remember, when we join the society for Rousseau, we give up everything. We're all equal. With Locke, we only give up some things. That, and we retain our liberty with others. So we have a different understanding of liberty and equality in Locke and Rousseau. Um, I no longer am that, I'm no longer the, the individual, so say, when I join, when I join society. In fact, what happens to the noble savage? You see, in a certain sense, I've left that. And the only, I think there are two options for Rousseau. One, you drop out, or two, you're in. You're either in or you're out. So the out could be some kind of beatnik on the corner, noble savage, that kind of thing, who, who hasn't been touched by this society or, or revolution. And, uh, and then they, but for the most of us, it is becoming on the road to become a social being. And uh, that is maybe difficult for Lockians to understand, but that's where we're going. It's, we're, uh, we're leaving behind the idea of the rugged individual or this individual taking care of themselves. And now we're, we're looking upon us as being a member of a community and not to be selfish. To being, being insensitive is the worst thing you can be for Rousseau in a society, not caring about others. And so, that this, so what has political economy become? The political economy becomes political, economic, and government. That is, if we're all in it. But then don't you have to select some people to run the show? We all can't run the show all the time, can we? Well, he says, you can gather 300 people together. You can get such and such. So, oh, so Rousseau, you, are, you have a much more sentimental feeling for direct democracy and Athens. Um, yeah. What's wrong with Athens where people gather on the spot? They make a common sense. We're not asking for hands. We're not mm -hmm. asking for, certainly not secret ballots. Right. Which would you say, lock, I'm going to pull the ballot, pull the screens, and nobody's going to see what I do. You're open. Mm -hmm. and but we will naturally perceive what the general will is. This becomes, that's right, because that's who we are now. And so we there's, are a transformed individual. And so this is a crucial difference, I think, as well, that we'll see played out in others, that by in the right system, human nature can actually be transformed by it. Oh, the, the, answer is, the answer is yes. Um, and part of um, the transformation of human beings is being transformed for them, say, being individuals, even noble savages, to being good citizens or good communitarians, good, uh, uh, good social thinkers. Um, so there's a transformation in what the human being can be. So there's nothing that's very human, because a human being can be taught. Humans can change their nature. That's not possible in, in Locke. Unless you give your consent and then you re restrain it. So yeah, what I mean, Locke's understanding of human nature is, as it comes from this, his state of nature, and it's that you're always required under Locke by God or by yourself, by self-preservation or both, uh, to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think in Rousseau's general will, it's we take care of each other. And Locke is we take care of each other by taking care of ourselves. Right, and so Dr. Lloyd, I think you make a very good last point there. Uh, again, another point of important difference that we'll see throughout these next three sessions, where Rousseau sees the possibility of creating a society that can actually alter or shape human nature, whereas Locke is taking a much more fundamental look at human nature being almost immovable and creating a society around it that can make and take the best
of human beings and mankind more broadly. Well, I think we've really set the table here for our next sessions. And Dr. Lloyd, thanks so much for uh, really setting the foundation here for the following conversations. I look forward to our next one as we focus on the work of Adam Smith. I look forward to you joining us then. Thanks.